This is world chess champion Garry Kasparov. Some consider him to be the greatest player of all time. Here he is in the midst of the final game of six against Deep Blue, IBM's revolutionary supercomputer. In a few seconds time, Kasparov will realize his worst fears. There'll be no way for him to beat the machine. In this moment, the 21st century begins three years early. It is the start of the age of the algorithms. And if you pause right here, you can see the moment where his heart breaks. <laughs> the machines are taking over. The 20th century was mostly quite optimistic about its mechanized future. It foresaw a world where our material needs, wants, and perverted urges would be fulfilled by an army of dead-eyed domestic automatons. Alas, we are a fifth of the way through the 21st century now, and we're still unclogging our own toilets, making our own meals, and rubbing our glands against our fellow flesh drones. But what the irradiated inhabitants of the previous century failed to foresee was the rise of algorithms. So what is an algorithm? At its core, an algorithm is a process, usually followed by a computer through calculations or other problem-solving operations. And this is not artificial intelligence. And I'm hesitant to ever really use that phrase, because right now I think it's more of a sales pitch than it is natural reality. Which is just as well, as an algorithm is much less likely to command an army of exoskeletons in some blue-tinted post-nuclear future to come crush your skull to dust. But they are starting to make these squishy nerve sacs in our skulls look obsolete. There are hundreds of different kinds of algorithms, but for conceptual clarity, I'll be splitting them into two distinct camps. Rule system algorithms and machine learning algorithms. Rule system algorithms are relatively simple. They are a set of step-by-step -step instructions written by a human for a computer to follow. They do not veer from the strict if-then formula they are given. Say I taught a rule-based algorithm to eat mayonnaise. It would follow every step of the instructions that I laid out for it. But if it encountered an obstacle I hadn't prepared it for, it would be stumped. No delicious egg paste for Mr. Algorithm. That's where the sexy and sophisticated machine learning algorithms come in. They too are given a goal to achieve, but they are given no direct path to its completion. Rather, they learn to find their solution through data analysis. They essentially acquire this data through a process of repeated failure, running through a variety of solutions before arriving at their desired outcome. Machine learning algorithms are capable of solving complex problems, but because they work problems out for themselves, their process can be unpredictable. So they have to be written unambiguously to avoid undesirable or even disastrous interpretations of their goal. You remember Facebook? It's the place where your old school friends post racist rants and pictures of their poor life choices dressed in cute little outfits. Personally, I don't have a face page. I'm still on MySpace. Come back, guys. Me, Tom, and all your mid-2000s favorites are still waiting for you. But there's one thing on Facebook that's even more terrifying than the prospect of your ex-boyfriend's engagement announcement, and that's targeted ads. Most targeted ads are a little creepy, but ultimately harmless. They analyze your web history and deliver you products that they think you're interested in. And like adverts on TV and in other outdated forms of media, there are rules about misleading products or false claims. But Facebook have inexplicably made an exception for political ads. You can lie in them as much as you like. They can tell you that Brexit causes skin cancer or that Bernie Saunders sets fire to homeless people in his spare time. But what makes this particularly worrying is how good these algorithms are at targeting people who are going to believe these lies, as in some significant ways, Facebook knows you better than anyone you've ever poked. Remember poking? Simpler times. Researchers at Stanford and Cambridge conducted a large-scale study with 17,000 Facebook users. Using a standard psychometric questionnaire, they wanted to find out whether the Facebook algorithm knew you better than your friends and family. And as you might expect from my general tone of bemused nihilism, the machine won. Easily. Given access to your social media history, the algorithm only needed 70 likes to beat your roommate and only needed 300 to beat your spouse or partner. Incredible, considering a human being needs millions of likes and an RCA record deal before they can get away with beating their partner. This is significant because political groups who understand the algorithm can easily game the system, using it as a sort of gullibility funnel to pour bullshit down the throats of people who don't have a functioning gag reflex for propaganda. 
It's like being able to sell heroin outside the methadrone clinic. Targeted ads and recommendation algorithms have the power to present us a version of the world that conforms to our tastes, but also to our preconceived biases. With each brick of data that we're giving to these companies, we're building our own personal little brain bunkers, protecting us from information that doesn't conform to our ideas of the world. Every time you use Google Maps, withdraw money from a cash machine, or thumb through a parade of Tinder profiles, you're using an algorithm. The main purpose of these algorithms are to save us time, and to replace processes that before would have required a lot of legwork and tedious human interaction. They're like cheat codes for real life, but they only make our heads extra large in a metaphorical sense. But like cheat codes, the more you use them, the harder it is to play the game without them. In June 2016, a man named Daniel Ali drove his car into a lake because his GPS told him to. And while this was hilarious, it's not an isolated incident. People have followed their GPSs into the desert, into the sea, and straight off cliffs. Wildlife coordinators in California national parks have even coined the term death by GPS to refer to people who have followed their phones all the way into the wilderness and straight out of the gene pool. This is a rather extreme example of how quickly we've adapted to letting algorithms do our mind chores for us. The irony is that when an algorithm is created that radically streamlines any process, it can lead to an overall reduction in human ability. In other words, our unconscious and enthusiastic adoption of algorithms threatens to turn us into code-dependent, grunting meat marionettes. And we can already observe this happening in small ways. It's why no one remembers phone numbers anymore, why it's difficult to orientate yourself about a GPS, or why I feel crippling anxiety whenever I have to interact with an actual human in a retail setting. But then who can blame us when algorithms are already proving that they can do what we once thought was impossible? Since 2012, police departments in America have been using PredPol. And while that sounds like a Daily Mail headline about a Polish grooming gang, it's actually a data analysis algorithm that can help predict crime. That's right, baby, we're only one swift Philip K. kick from a full sci-fi dystopia. So, how does it work? Well, it sounds crazy, but it's actually pretty simple. It looks at records from previous crimes, their type, location, and time of occurrence, and then it provides a geographical area where crime is likely to be committed next. Departments can then send their officers to the donut shop closest to the area, and therefore make patrols less scattered and more efficient. But some people suggest that PredPol and algorithms like it look less like Minority Report and look more like a minority... report. There are some serious concerns that predictive policing could amplify already discriminatory practices by the police and could end up justifying surveillance tactics with an air of scientific objectivity. So it's not focused on the individual, it's focused on the events themselves. Although it, it does zoom in it does real zoom tight in. on people. And not on people, on places. Well, right? where they live. Right, where they live. Yeah, we're not watching you, we're just watching your house and everyone who comes in and out of it. Like most successful algorithms, PredPol is the closely guarded intellectual property of the company that designed it. And this is dangerous because it means that independent evaluations of their processes can't be made. Experts call this the black box problem, which is a bit like Schrodinger's cat, except we're not wondering whether the cat's dead or not, we just don't know if it's wearing a fucking clan hood. This allows police departments to effectively outsource their moral responsibility to a machine, hiding behind the mystique of an apparently objective process that they probably don't understand either. We vigorously deny any accusations of racist policing. We're just doing what the algorithm told us. It's objective. It's science. Now everyone line up to get your heads measured. I'm seeing some pretty criminal shaped craniums out there. We are increasingly relying on this technology every day. And if we can't independently scrutinize it, then we're going to be unprepared when it stops working. In 2008, Google released their flu trend algorithm. It recorded people's search terms for things like cough, phlegm, or firing indiscriminately out of both ends. It then mapped these searches geographically and found correlations, allowing them to pop America's proverbial snot bubbles before they reached critical mass. And for three years, it worked, outperforming the Center for Disease Control's detection by an average of 10 days. But then something happened. Like someone who's unknowingly caught the norovirus on a long haul coach trip, the algorithm shat its pants dramatically. A large flu outbreak occurred in 2013, so large that people all over the country were Googling flu related symptoms whether they were ill or not. As a result, the algorithm massively over predicted potential outbreaks in a very real way 
it had caught the nation's collective hypochondria. Google quietly killed the program, but its initial success and ultimate failure poses a very interesting moral quandary when it comes to algorithms. These prediction and correlation algorithms are a bit like your girlfriend's irritating best friend. The more private information they get, the more powerful they become. Google flu trends failed partly because the data it was collecting was insufficient. If more sophisticated algorithms had access to things like our smart health devices or our financial transactions, then there's no telling what they could be capable of. They may be able to diagnose us before we know we're sick. They could predict economic instability and manage food shortages. And this is the choice we must now all contend with. We can cede our privacy and make this technology more efficient, or we can throttle its effectiveness by hoarding our data. In many sectors, algorithms are becoming so efficient that they're actually threatening our jobs. In the future of employment, researchers Frey and Osborne predict that in the next 10 or 20 years, 47% of American jobs are in danger of being automated. So we all might need to start looking over our shoulder for Randy the Redundancy Robot. Demonetized. Oh. Formerly safe professions are in the job terminator's crosshair too. Accountancy, advertisers, and especially people in retail. One silver lining is that the financial sector is already feeling the pinch, with the former CEO of Citibank predicting that there'll be 30% less jobs in banking in the next five years. Meaning at least one amusing sideshow of our dystopian future will be former bankers living on the street, wrestling one another for the last pot of industrial strength hair gel. Luckily, there's no way an algorithm can make YouTube videos because there's no formula for what I do, right? Progress can be a scary thing. We like to imagine it as a straight line, but more often than not, it resembles an exchange. Because there will always be people who feel like they've been shortchanged by history. Algorithms offer a Faustian New Deal for our future. They present a world of efficiency, convenience, and collective intelligence. And in return, all they're asking for is a piece of your privacy, and perhaps your livelihood. Terrible idea.